I'm Al McFarlane. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarlane, broadcasting from the Marcus Garvey House here in North Minneapolis. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. It's a wonderful conversation, a robust conversation. One of the guides for this conversation is my brother, who takes us on a musical journey, Wayne McFarland and Jazz. Check him out. McFarland, welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Over the summer, we've heard stories, watched stories developing about uh, changes in the banking industry, the financial industry regarding mortgages. I'm pleased to have on today's program Nathan A. Greneman, who is Deputy Attorney General for the state of Minnesota, who worked to advocate and to assure Minnesota's interest in this national suit. The suit challenged five major companies uh, with their practices for hiring and lending, particularly to minority communities. Nathan, thank you for being here. Uh, I want you to start this program by telling us the background. And as you described uh, what happened nationally and then Minnesota's interest, I want our panel here to weigh in with questions to clarify. Our goal here is to explain what's happened nationally in the housing market, uh, the foreclosure problems and challenges, the solutions being offered by the government and that some companies are responding to. I've asked President of the Minneapolis Urban League, Scott Gray, to join me thank hosting God. this program. Scott, thank you. And also Reverend Randolph Stadden, who is the representative of the Coalition of Black Churches and African American Leadership Summit to join, and a former state legislator as well. So person knowledgeable about the question of housing in our community here. First of all, Nathan Brenneman, thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me, Mr. McFarland. And if you would, background. This was big news when it broke this summer about a settlement with five major banks uh, around the mortgage crisis in the country. Give us the backstory. Well, this settlement, the discussions of this settlement started back in the fall of 2010. Um, and it really started with uh, what came to light as uh, what was exposed as um, robo-signing that had been occurring by, by all servicers, or some more than others, uh, robo-signing uh, by them of affidavits that were then filed in court uh, to procure foreclosures on certain properties. Uh, this came to light quite publicly. The New York Times reported on it. It was reported uh, elsewhere. And shortly after that, uh, a 50-state attorney general investigation was developed to investigate those allegations of robo-signing of affidavits. Uh, from there, however, it expanded. Uh, the the um, federal government got involved, in particular HUD and DOJ uh, got involved with the states to investigate. And what started as an investigation just into uh, robo-signing uh, developed into a broader uh, conversation with the five biggest servicers uh, about settling uh, what were pretty commonly recognized problems with the way that these servicers were uh, dealing with homeowners uh, who were in trouble on their mortgages. Uh, we, I know that in our office we have been hearing from uh, homeowners for a long time who are falling behind on their payments, trying to talk to their servicer about what to do, and really getting the runaround from the servicers and not getting straight answers, applying for loan modifications and not knowing whether or not they're going to get it having lost paperwork, not being able to talk to the same person, all sorts of problems. And so it was, I think many states were having the same sort of troubles. And so uh, it quickly expanded to talk about servicing more generally and how the five uh, biggest banks, I should just name who those were for you. Those are Bank of America, Citi, uh, Chase, Wells Fargo, and GMAC, which is now Ally Bank. Um, and so negotiations began. 
all through 2011, uh, negotiations uh, went forward. There was an executive uh, committee among the, s the states that was leading the negotiations on behalf of the states. Minnesota was not on the executive committee, but we were following it closely, what was going on. Uh, and they, with the, the Department of Justice and the Housing and Urban Development from the federal standpoint primarily, although there were other agencies involved as well, uh, came to uh, a settlement that we're here to talk about today, uh, which is a t uh, which has uh, been widely reported as a $25 billion uh, settlement nationally against the, the biggest five lenders. Mm -hmm. And so the background, you said it started off with uh, the government looking at robo-signing, this technique, but it expanded into examining the, the wider uh, relationship between consumers and the banks, what were the findings? How did that expansion take place and what kinds of things were discovered in that process? Well, the robo-signing uh, was confirmed. It turned out that... Uh, what is robo-signing? Well, in order to prove uh, that a servicer is entitled to foreclose on a property, in many states, uh, you need to go before a judge. The servicer needs to go before a judge and submit an affidavit, which is essentially the proof of you know, that this homeowner was delinquent in their mortgage, that that this servicer uh, holds title to this property and they have the mortgage on it and the, because they're in default, they're entitled to uh, acquire the property. These were being uh, mass produced and verified by, by um, no one in particular and not even read by the person who was uh, signing off on it. And so there was really a lack of diligence on behalf of the servicers to really dot the I's and cross the T's uh, to foreclose on these properties and obtain. I mean, what they were doing by, by showing these to courts is obtaining these people's homes. And uh, it was just, I think, uh, shocking to many people that there was be so lax in, in the... Um, cavalier. And cavalier uh, about proving that these people, they were getting back these people's homes. And so, um, and it, it also turned out that there was allegations of, of for just straight forgery that, that they had... Uh, um, I think it was called the surrogate signer program where, mm -hmm. where they had a raft of people signing another person's name uh, on documents that were then mm -hmm. presented to court. So um, that, that was borne out. But uh, what also came to light, uh, many of the servicing problems that I just talked about, I'm, uh, I think that uh, uh, many states have experienced that and it's just undeniable. The servicers, for whatever reasons, uh, simply we're not doing a good job in working with homeowners uh, to uh, talk to them about their their mitigation options when they were facing uh, delinquency. Uh, you know, the horror stories just go on and on in terms of uh, people who were, uh, you know, in their homes, uh, they had some problem in their life, unemployment or a health problem or mm -hmm. something else. They were reaching out to their lender to see if there was any opportunity to to, to stay in the home, to get on a modification type plan. And, and the servicers, um, I don't know how else to say it, but just didn't do a very good job. They, sometimes they would uh, dual track people, which means sure, we'll talk to you about modification, but at the same time, we're gonna go ahead and start processing your foreclosure. And so you had these ridiculous circumstances mm -hmm. where you may have sure. uh, a homeowner who gets a letter saying, congratulations, you're ready for a trial plan. At the same time, they're receiving a letter from the same servicer saying, in two weeks, we're gonna foreclose on your property. And so, you know, there were all yeah. these left hand not knowing what the right hand was doing, all these problems with the servicers. And I think that the, uh, w the more we learned and the more we uh, talked, got into the investigation, some of those things were definitely borne out. Let me put this in context, uh, reference that, let me go to you. And I want you to talk about this era. There was a time when uh, this community and all communities around the country were, I think, moving aggressively to get people into home ownership. We had discussions on this program about uh, the pathway to wealth creation, that it was necessary, important to figure out how people could get the right kind of advice, the right kinds of deals, and move into uh, becoming a homeowner to build equity. The mission was to build wealth in our community, and we said uh, many, many times that the pathway to wealth for Americans is in the home ownership and the mortgage. A lot of people got into the housing market. The backstory then to the need to examine 
the issue that we were looking at today, and that's the, the robo, robo signing and people needing uh, modifications and foreclosure prevention, is that there was this period where a lot of people were actively becoming homeowners, but there were some failures at the same time. Would you give the backstory from your point of view, what uh, the lay of the land was in general? Well, Al, I think you're, you're exactly right. And I'm interested in hearing uh, uh, some additional information about how the agreement came about, what's in the agreement in terms of making people whole again. Because part of what we understand uh, is that we want people to have their initiative, as politically is talked about before, to take initiative to want to change their lives and so forth. But there are so, also so many things from an institutional point of view uh, that has caused institutional racism to, to exist to such a degree that now we have been sort of set back from a major initiative of home ownership uh, that we were aspiring for to. Uh, at the time, we were talking about 71% of whites were home ownerships and only 21% of blacks were home ownerships. And what we wanted to do, we had a 50-30 plan. Uh, the, the plan was to move at least 50% of blacks into home ownership by the age of 30. Uh, that's moving into an area by which you can also begin to accumulate wealth. This crisis has come along, uh, and what we see it is, is that it has been a major institutional setback from a problem that was already exacerbated mm -hmm. with the kind of disparities that exist between blacks and whites. I'm interested in also hearing when we look at what the final conclusions were, because we are now in a situation right now by which um, we understand that large numbers of blacks and Hispanics and so forth were not responsible uh, for what happened. We also understand now that people who want to buy homes find it more difficult to be able to get into homes because they, in fact, the victim is still being blamed. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we look at the solutions, I think it, it's interesting to know or to see whether or not the solutions reach the part of making people or communities whole again. It may, it may in fact, uh, benefit some number of individuals, but it does not deal with the kind of institutional problem that has been set up by which it's still more difficult now uh, for blacks and Hispanics to be able to get home ownership. And so those are, there are a number of questions uh, that we have. Um, and I guess I'm also interested in, in um, and from a political point of view, you, you want to know uh, how the agreement, and it sounds wonderful, uh, and I, you know, it's really kind of, there's some different kind of things happening when I go into, into Wells Fargo now. Uh, I, I bank at Wells Fargo, and I said to, my, I said to, the, to the, may I speak to the, to the general manager? Uh, and he must, he thought I had some problem with him. I said, wow, what's happening here? Everybody is so friendly. I've never seen so many black and Hispanic employees hired in my life. And I also understand that that doesn't just happen. There has to be something that motivated a move into this area. So I see from a complexion point of view, from a people, uh, from a number of black folks who have, my son even was hired a, a couple of months ago in, in, well, in Wells Fargo. And when you walk into Wells Fargo, you see something different. Uh, and, and, and so I knew that there was something institutionally that had happened to also motivate uh, management to come up with some policies like that. But so there are a lot of questions we still are asking because from an institutional point of view, we see a major setback mm -hmm. with the actions that occurred with the foreclosures and so forth. Let me ask you, Scott Gray, to reflect on the same question. In terms of the backstory, you've been here as president of the Minneapolis Urban League for a couple of years now, but before that, you uh, were the Urban League CEO in Milwaukee? In Madison. Madison, yeah. Madison, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. But from Madison and also from the purview to the degree, degree that you can say it, of the National Urban League, what was the housing story? Uh, how big a story was this and, and how big of a hit has our community taken because of the housing sure. mortgage foreclosure crisis? Sure, well, just to, to dovetail on Reverend Stanton's point, um, that it was already a problem even when um, even when housing, when the housing industry was, was good for people of color and we were seeing an increase in uh, minorities 
particularly African Americans and Hispanic populations moving into home ownership. Um, at the same time, it was low. It was low in, in the Twin Cities. It's low in Madison. It's low in Milwaukee. Uh, it's, it's lower than our white counterparts across the country. Um, particularly when you look at um, building wealth, as you alluded to earlier, um, we talk about white families with an average net worth of nearly $100,000, and you talk about black families with uh, 20, 20 times less than that. And so when you look at the when the bubble busted or bursted, um, we're seeing um, African American families with net worth lower than $5,000. And so to me, that is not the opportunity a lot of us would use that opportunity to to start a business, to send our children to college, uh, to even leverage to purchase another home, uh, and just have that stability. That is gone and wiped out. And I'm not sure that $25 billion, um, it, is, it is a good monetary number, but when we dig behind the scenes and really see what's happening now, we get folks that are coming in our doors at the Minneapolis Urban League saying that this is egregious, this could be criminal, um, th we don't trust the banks, and to me, $25 billion is far less than what it's going to take to repair and make folks feel comfortable with the financial system moving forward, although that has been what really one of our pathways for building wealth. That's right. That's so right. it, it, to me, it's crippling, and we have to figure out, uh, and I hope our, our AG is, is, is helping us figure out he, that here in Minnesota, is what is going to be much more intentional, because when I look at the $25 billion, I look at folks who, who need to be kept whole who are in their home or who have lost their home, they will have the opportunity to, to pull down some of these dollars. But I don't see it, $25 billion in any new home ownership opportunities for people in the community. So I'd like to talk about that a little bit more as we move forward in the program. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll continue the discussion in just a couple of seconds, talking about the home ownership, the uh, mortgage crisis. It's an important issue about the solutions being afforded by the federal government and by the state of Minnesota. Pleased to have as our guest, Nathan A. Brenneman, who is Deputy Attorney General, talking about Minnesota's participation in the national settlement. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Shine, sun, shine that I may grow, then my warm moonbeams will blow. Shine, sun, shine that I may live, long enough to give the love I Shine and I may live long enough to give the love I need to give. Even those words, it says, you know, this, you don't want to leave this world, you know. It says, for all I know, this world may end tomorrow. I don't want to leave this world laden with sorrow. So while I've got just one more day, got one more day, I take this opportunity to say that time. Shine, sun, shine and I may live long enough to give the love I Shine your light on me. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. We're talking about the historic bank settlement. Uh, the federal government pushed the banking industry about uh, mortgage problems, people, the foreclosure crisis. And we wanted to sort of explain that in today's program, uh, explain who was involved, 
what the terms of the settlement were. I'm pleased to have uh, to do that one of the representatives of uh, Minnesota's participation in the settlement. Nate Brenneman is Deputy Attorney General and is here to talk about the settlement. And so, Nate, let me turn to you again. Uh, would you sort of explore the key provisions of the settlement? $25 billion that the federal government got an agreement from five major companies. Uh, those companies, Ally Bank, which used to be GMAC, uh, Bank of America, Citibank, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Wells Fargo. And so $25 billion to do what? Well, thank you. And uh, I can definitely explain the, the main terms of the settlement. I'd like to, to start, though, uh, just responding to, to a few of the comments in, in that, you know, this settlement uh, isn't, in my view, and isn't, wasn't intended to be, I think, a, f a full um, uh, solution to the foreclosure crisis that we have in this country or the, the housing crisis that we have uh, in this country. What it was, uh, remember, it was only with the five major servicers. Uh, and what it was primarily intended to do, I believe, was to provide some uh, immediate relief to homeowners, fix some of the servicing standards, the problem of which I was discussing uh, previously, and to uh, attempt for people who are on the fence having trouble with their mortgages to try to keep them in their homes. And so let me talk a little bit about the key terms. Uh, the first of which is there are new servicing standards uh, uh, that the servicers need to follow. Some of the problems I addressed is hopefully going to alleviate uh, those problems. People before, when they wrote, you know, won't get answers back from servicers. Now there's timelines on which people, the servicers need to write back and tell people whether or not they have a modification. So those get quite in depth. Like I said, it's 40 pages, but it, it, it is intended, I think, to, to solve some of the problems with servicing that we saw before. Uh, and then the monetary aspects. Uh, there is a uh, the biggest component of the settlement, I think it's 17 billion out of the 25 billion dollars, is what is called the federal menu options. It was the federal part of the settlement that the federal government primarily negotiated. Uh, how that breaks down for Minnesota, let me back up and talk federal versus Minnesota. So the federal settlement was 25 billion dollars. The state's share is approximately uh, 280 million dollars, with an M, million. Um, of that, about 167 million is this, these uh, uh, called the federal menu. And what, what that is is that that's, um, the servicers can essentially earn uh, credits uh, that will accumulate up to $167 million by doing a number of things that are designed to help peop keep people in their homes. So people who are in their homes having trouble making their mortgage payments this is going to help them get first lien principal reductions. Uh, secondly, if they have a second mortgage on their house, there are, many people will be eligible for a second lien principal reduction. So they'll bring down the amount of the uh, money they owe on the house and therefore bring down the monthly payment that they owe on the house as well. Uh, short sales, as you mentioned, Mr. Gray. Um, uh, deeds in lieu. Uh, whenever a bank uh, accomplishes and works out with a homeowner one of these situations that will help a homeowner stay in their home, they earn a credit. Uh, towards the, 20, the 17 billion, or the in Minnesota, the 167 um, million dollars, and so uh, it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly because sometimes it's a one-to-one -one credit. So every dollar that they give someone in a principal reduction will be a earned credit. Sometimes they only earn 50 cents for every dollar of aid that they give uh, to a homeowner, but that. That is uh, primarily designed to keep people in their homes. Uh, the direct payment part of the settlement uh, has a little bit different focus. That's for people who have been foreclosed on, who had a sheriff's sale occur on their home between January 1st, 2008 and December 31st, 2011. And for those people, that's a process that's underway right now, in fact. In Minnesota, the letters, the claim forms just went out to Minnesotans here on October 12th. Most of the letters went out. And so uh, I think there are s between 40 and 50,000 eligible uh, consumers who were foreclosed on in that time period. They will all receive a claim form uh, that they, if they fill out and return it will uh, allow them to get some uh, monetary relief. It's projected to be around $1,500 uh, per borrower. And again, I don't think that anybody 
uh, would say that that you know equates for every person to the harm that they suffered, but this was a settlement intended, I think, to bring some immediate relief to people who were foreclosed on. Uh, and so, those are the servicing standards, the direct payment, the the um, the federal menu. Those are some of the key components of the settlement. Uh, Reverend Stetton. Yeah, I. Uh First, I want to thank you for being here. <laughs> um, and, and I want to thank you, Al, for also making this possible. I think this is a critical piece of that we need to have more dialogue and more discussion on, even dialogue about who decided who gets what, who decided what part was going to be in claims. I understand that it's not going to solve all of the problems uh, as far as the crisis is concerned. Uh, but when we come up with the solutions, if in fact we're saying that claims are going to be sent out, that monies would be available as far as, as, far as preventing foreclosure, uh, but people also end up having to qualify, which means that you have a larger number of people who still may be employed that may end up being able to qualify for those funds, and other people who in fact part of the claim was designated that here is a group of people, blacks and Hispanics, that were specifically and egregiously hurt, and that's part of why the claim, does the relief then also come uh, in some kind of significant way to those folk who we say were injured in terms of bringing the claim from the very beginning, if you understand part of what it is that I'm, that I'm saying. So how these things get worked out, it could even be that in fact we started off with one group of people who we say we're using because we know, and I understand you used blacks and, and, and Hispanics because it was, um, they were more seriously and profoundly, you could see it, clearly affected. Uh, but, what, what ha but when you come up with the solutions, do we have the same kind of thought process added in there to reach the people who were affected? What's your sense? So are, are we targeting and delivering relief and um, remedy to the people we've described as uh, damaged by this process? What do you think? Or even that said, is it included in the thought process? Well, I can tell you, uh, for the direct payment part of the, the um, settlement, that's the part where it's people who have been foreclosed on. Um, uh, you know, that information came from the banks. I mean, it's it's everyone who was foreclosed on in Minnesota in a certain time period where the servicer was one of these five uh, largest banks and the foreclosure sale happened in a, in a particular uh, time period. Now, uh, so, you know, it's pretty, the relief is there's a structure for it. It's just, it's just everybody who was foreclosed on by one of these uh, five banks. and. Uh, I know that for our part, we're really trying to maximize Minnesota's share of that settlement, and we've been reaching out and to uh, our uh, housing advocates and community organizations around the metro and around the state to try to get the word out to people, because we can really maximize the benefit of the settlement uh, in Minnesota uh, by having good education and good public awareness that these claim forms are coming, that people should look at them, mm -hmm. that people should fill them out and get them and get them back. Because I think we have a lot of dialogue to do. But see, I remember sitting in on, after the fact, the tobacco settlements uh, that occurred. A significant settlement that occurred as far as the state of Minnesota is concerned. I think the attorneys probably made most of the money as far as it was concerned. But we also discovered that, in fact, there was a disproportionate number of African Americans who were affected by smoking, but when the relief mechanisms were put in place, African American institutions received very little, if any, of the kind of dollars uh, that would help deal with the problem and the relief as far as the problem is concerned. And so, you know, you, you're just concerned that we, about who gets brought into the discussion about what happened and when do they get in brought into the discussion about what happened? Does it occur after everything has already been divided up, or does it occur before it's divided up? Scott? And, and that's certainly a good point. I, I would just ask um, the Deputy General that it sounds to me that 
you know, we, we've been allocated $280 million, but it sounds like if we don't get enough education out to the homeowners or the folks that face the challenge, it sounds like either we, we're going to lose that money if we don't find enough folks that can take advantage of it, um, or maybe this is my question, where does it go if, if we can only find $100 million to use towards families that need this relief, where does, where does the additional dollars go, if, if I might ask? Well, it depends on the bucket of money. I mean, uh, again, it gets a little complicated, but for the, the federal relief uh, that I discussed, there's $167 million, and that's really up to the, to the banks. Now, that may sound a little bit like the Fox Garden uh, hen house, but the banks uh, are the ones who initiate the principal reductions, the short sales, et cetera. Now, there is a federal monitor in the, uh, built into the process who's supposed to, one of his key functions is making sure that the money is fairly allocated for that part of it between the states. So Minnesota, for instance, doesn't get uh, it, not its fair share. But for this direct payment piece that I've been talking about, for the people who are actually foreclosed on, there's just $1.5 billion set aside for that. Now, claim forms are going out in every state at the same time, and it's really a function of how many people respond. And so the projected amount that Minnesota's going to get is around $34 million for that piece of it. Okay. But it all depends on the amount, number of people who right. send their claim form back. Now, if we get some sort of 90% uh, response rate, we're going to get a bigger cut of the $1.5 billion than if some other state only has a 20% a response rate. Okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sure, so it's not sure. set in stone. Sure. As many claims as we get sent back, send sure. in are going to be paid. And so I think that's why we've been really reaching out to housing advocates, our community uh, organizations, to try to spread the word, hey, these claim forms are coming. Mm -hmm. Make sure you pay attention to them, fill them back out, get them in. Let's sure. get our fair share of the sure. money sure. here in Minnesota. Are you, are you getting a feeling that, that your, your partners in the settlement, the five banks, um, are, are they doing enough outreach? Um, you know, is this and a what partnership? what kind of outreach are you doing? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what are you doing? But are your partners doing enough? Are they required right. to do outreach by the terms of the settlement? Yeah. Well, the banks uh, primarily are required to, well, they're required to um, give the relief under the federal menu part of the settlement that we've been talking about. And they really have an incentive to do that. I mean, th that may sound, it's not aspirational. If they don't pay their $17 billion worth at the end of three years, they have to pay that amount plus penalties into the federal treasury. So they need to pay one way or the other. and. Uh, according to the monitor, they've at least started uh, that part of it where they are uh, helping people who are on the brink of losing their home. Um, but I think it remains to be seen largely whether or not they come through in that regard. Let me ask they, you one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go right ahead. Uh, just I'm let sorry. me finish with the yeah, servicing sure. I'm standards. Sorry. I'm the sorry. servicing standards, I think, are where we're really going to see the rubber meet the road. I know that we in our office get, uh, we've gotten hundreds of complaints from homeowners who are having trouble dealing with their servicer, working out an issue, uh, maybe delinquent on their mortgage and need some help. Um, and so the servicing standards, uh, they had 180 days to implement from the time of the settlement. That's just about now, in fact. And so now is when they should be implementing these. And I think over the next few months, hopefully, we are going to be able to tell, did they really take these to heart, or is it business as usual with, with these servicers? So, Let me ask one just real small question, uh, because we're at the point in which information is going out that people are supposed to respond to. Oftentimes, we need to interpret what this information is so people can respond to it. Uh, how much money? Has Insight News, for example, received for educating the public or doing information about this uh, that, that's happening now? Because, I mean, how, how you communicate says who might get the message or uh, how important it is for certain people to get the message. And so let me just ask that's a question a, about... It's a, a good question. It's a fair question. I think we've had one... Um, communication from Wells Fargo, uh, and that's recently about some classes they were uh, introducing to help people learn about their um, programs, but beyond that, none. And so I think that's consistent with uh, around the country. I'm 
uh, a member of the National Newspaper Publishers Association. That is the Black Press of America. 200 newspapers across the country that serve and address and provide voice to black people in every city, every major community in this country. And uh, the question is, has the settlement specifically reached out to our community using what we call the information infrastructure of our community right. to interpret right. and to engage our people? We'll come back and talk more about that. I'm Al McFarland, You're listening to Conversations with Al McFarland. When I come back, another person who's on the streets, on the trench, in the trenches on this issue of housing, uh, Ishmael Reed is director of the Northside Residence Redevelopment Council. Stay tuned. Oh, pirates, yes, the robber. So light to the merchant ships. Moments after they come, it took out from the bottomless pits. But my hand was made strong by the hands of the Almighty, and we forward this generation triumphantly. Won't you help me sing this song of freedom? It's all I ever had A dear song He emancipates yourself from into slavery For none of them can free our mind Have no fear for atomic energy Cause no one I did my can stop all the time how long shall we kill our prophets while we stand aside and look at yeah, yeah, yeah. They say it's just part of it. We've got to fulfill the boon. Won't you help me sing? I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. I misintroduced my next guest. I called him Ishmael Reed. Uh, his name is Ishmael Israel. So Ishmael, first of all, I apologize and thank you for being here. Uh, but not to um, say that uh, it wasn't a good mistake because Ishmael Reed's a great novelist, a great poet, one of the greats in our community. Uh, but Ishmael Israel, thank you for being here. You uh, lead a legacy organization in North Minneapolis, an organization of residents that uh, I think uh, by its very nature has to have its um, uh, finger on the pulse of the issue of home ownership and foreclosure in our community. And how big has this problem been? Uh, housing has been one of the defining characteristics of this neighborhood forever. And particularly as the neighborhood went from being a, uh, a white neighborhood to a black neighborhood, now it's going back to being white again, but housing has always been at the center of that, and we've always had conversations about uh, how we create wealth and how, again, we improve and modify and clean up and fix up uh, the housing stock, and that means in part fixing up the uh, knowledge and opportunity for the families, the people that have been renters or that are moving to different houses. Uh, what's been the impact of the housing crisis in general and what do you see as the potential positive outcomes of this settlement to the degree that you're aware of it? <clears throat> well, leading up into the 2000s, as, as the market was relatively stable and before it took off on a boom, there was a great opportunity to create wealth in the community. Um, housing stock was at, uh, at a low, and it, at the time the interest rates were low as well, and it created an opportunity for renters to become owners and owners to renegotiate what may not have been the best mortgage loan terms. Um, unfortunately, what happened as, as, the market, uh, as the market went up and housing values went up, I think unscrupulous lending practices took away of a, of a great opportunity. And so you had introduced to the market two-year adjustable rate mortgages, three-year adjustable rate mortgages, 30-day adjustable rate mortgages, where homeowners had, had had taken a piece of the American dream 
and 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 fully recognized it only to have it snatched from them and so what we would hope that would come from what, what this settlement would be a catalyst of is to um, our market is at all time low again and so maybe for some of those to some of those that have had broken dreams to re for those to be rematerial rematerialized and 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 um and come and and just come back to life again so that's what that's what we're hoping um what what we fear as an agency whose whose main duty it is to inform the residents is that information isn't flowing and the resources to flow that information aren't being aren't being provided and so my question about the settlement is is it up to the banks to do this outreach and more funds set aside to do this or are we left to the good the good intention of these same banks that came to a settlement to do the right thing and make sure that they do reach out to the African Americans and to the Hispanic community residents. What do you think? Uh, well, you, you, I, you mentioned that your department, you know, the Attorney General is trying to partner with agencies and organizations. Have you reached out to this one in particular, Northside Residents Redevelopment Council? You might not know, but ha if you haven't, this is the kind of organization that you want as a partner, I think. Yeah. So what are you doing? And, and to his question, are the banks required to create partnerships and to, to resource uh, agencies and organizations like the Urban League so that they can do the work of ensuring that our community is aware and can engage uh, uh, to use the opportunity that the settlement provides? I uh, know the banks are not required uh, to form those sorts of partnerships that I know of. Um, listen, I couldn't agree with you more that, I mean, the, the cause of this more than anything else was the origination of bad loans and predatory lending and unscrupulous uh, lending practices. That combined with uh, then selling all of those loans on the secondary market and slicing and dicing them on Wall Street in an irresponsible way, uh, you know, when people began to not be able to make payments. The whole system collapsed and took much of the economy uh, down with it. And so, um, you know, it was a, a big problem, obviously. And again, I guess I'd, I'd reiterate that this, this settlement, I mean, I think no more needs to be done in addition to this mm -hmm. settlement. And I think um, uh, more can be done. And uh, I'm not sure if we partnered with mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Israel's uh, organization, I'm, or reached out to them uh, in the form of a letter. I, you would know, did you get our, our letter? I know that uh, our spokesperson, Ben Zwagslin, blasted it out to 80 organizations or more. Um, you know, if we haven't gotten in touch with someone, please reach out to us. We want to hear from people. Now, unfortunately, though, there's no mechanism for us to be able to divert funds to community organizations like yours under the settlement. Uh, you know, the state is getting uh, some money, but under state law, we can only do two things when we receive money under a settlement. We can, it can flow into the general fund for general use by the legislature, or uh, can be given to uh, individuals who were harmed by the bad acts. And so uh, our attorney general has decided to get money back to people who were harmed, homeowners who were foreclosed on, but there's not really the legislature has put limits on us that we can't ourselves divert funds to, to neighborhood organizations or community organizations, um, you know, for them to have the greatest impact in their community. Nevertheless, you know, we, our main objective right now, as I said before, is maximizing Minnesota's take uh, mm -hmm. of this settlement. And we'd like to, to get in contact with people, to reach out to people so that they're reaching out to the people they know of who are foreclosed on so that they send back those claim forms and we get our money for ourselves here in Minnesota. Reverend Seddon. Let me, uh, let me I'm, I'm trying to get uh, uh, to part of what has happened in the past to try to see what it is we maybe need to work on. For example, with the tobacco settlement, a number of agencies, organizations, and entities uh, had the, uh, were and in fact receive dollars and funds, for example, to, to be able to get out the word, to be able to get a new message about not smoking and blah, blah, and other kind of things like that. It would seem to me that in this matter, 
that as many people as possible, even if you're talking about people who are going to be receiving claims that they, that, uh, that they have, uh, there has to be some way by which uh, an organized method by which people are in fact notified by going through entities that they have confidence in, that they know about, and so forth. So are you saying that, in fact, there are no dollars that available to make that happen and so forth in terms of maximum communications with the people to make sure that they have claims and so forth that might be in place. I'm, 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 I'm still a little puzzled about how some of this, and I understand that, that not all of this, uh, that this doesn't belong to you, that uh, the Attorney General's Office have done uh, part of their job, that this is not a be-all, end-all solution as far as the impact of the, uh, the foreclosure, but it would seem to me from a political point of view, uh, I would want to make this a part of a comprehensive solution to deal with the major problem that was created in, 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 in that was created in the first place. Well, we at the office are trying to do our part on this problem and uh, the Attorney General, uh, I submit, has, has done a lot on housing. In 2006 and seven, she introduced a predatory lending bill that was really a model that was followed by many states afterwards and she got national recognition for that. And it really did, I think, have the effect to curb some of the predatory lending that was happening in this state. In 2009, she proposed and drafted a, a, a homeowner lender mediation bill that would have required lenders to sit down face to face with homeowners and talk to them before kicking them out of their house and foreclosing on them in a mediation. Um, that legislation actually passed both houses in 2009, but then was vetoed by then Governor uh, mm -hmm. Pawlenty. She tried to introduce that again in 2010 and it didn't uh, make it through committee. So uh, in addition to that, you know, we've heard from just hundreds and hundreds of individuals who've been having problems with their, their lenders and we tried to help each one of them uh, navigate the the whole labyrinth of trying to, to get a modification on your loan. So, you know, this, this uh, uh, and there's the settlement, which right now, you know, we are, we're just trying to, to maximize the um, effectiveness of this settlement for Minnesotans. This was a settlement that was uh, largely negotiated by the federal government. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we had the decision whether to sign on or not. It meant uh, $280 million for the state of Minnesota, and the decision was made uh, to sign on. And now we're just trying to see that the maximum um, possible amount of money uh, can get in the hands of Minnesotans under the settlement. Let me go to President Gray, president of the Minneapolis Urban League. How does this organization, Scott Gray, uh, sort of uh, connect with uh, the Attorney General's office and with the spirit of the national settlement as part of the National Urban League movement right. to ensure that uh, the home ownership and wealth creation strategy, as it's called, intersection, sure. uh, is part of the delivery sure. of a solution. Sure, well, thank you for asking the question. One is, is we're, you know, we're partnered with a number of, of groups that are on the ground, really, um, that are knocking on doors every day um, to get that message out, Reverend Stanton, that you talked about. And, and these are homeowners who, who are very weary um, and tired and want someone to come to their door um, that's going to support them and help shepherd them through uh, this long, um, in some cases, uh, very large task to keep their home. And so uh, we're grateful to be partnered with folks like NCRC um, and, and others to, to do this work. But I, I guess I, I want to, we need some help here. And one is, I, as I'm thinking about this, I have a child that's, that is in his uh, first year of college. And I am kind of lending him some money to get his four-year education. And, uh, and in a week or two, he's going to have a report card coming up. And I, I think this process needs a report card. And I, I hope that uh, kind of a midterm report card is there something that is that is being set up so that we can understand where folks are, where our community is, and where banks are in this process moving forward before the three-year clock um, runs out on us? There is. Mm -hmm. There is. It's uh, uh, there's a monitor built into the system who's going to have access uh, to all of the banks. 
uh, records. His name's Joe Smith. He's from, he resides in North Carolina. He's got some regulatory experience as well as some private experience. I don't uh, know a lot about him uh, personally, but he was chosen as a monitor. He is going to have the, the services also of some large auditors who are going to help him crunch the numbers that the banks are giving him about how they're performing under the settlement, and he's going to be issuing reports. One preliminary report has already been issued just to, to talk about the first few months of implementation of the program. I think that you c I don't have the website handy, but I'll be sure to provide sure. it to you. Uh, he has a website that, that has these reports open, and he is going to be reporting on the effectiveness of the settlement and the bank's compliance with it. Um, you know, I think a big question is, um, I think that's a big question in everybody's mind, and I don't know how effective this um, monitor will be, but I sure. hope he is effective, and I hope he holds the banks accountable. Do you know if that's two, three months, four months out, when... When is when might he have his first preliminary report? Well, the first preliminary report has already come out, okay. and it's shown uh, fairly uh, spotty compliance, to be honest. But many mm -hmm. of the banks complained that they hadn't gotten everything up and running yet. Bank of America, I think, was the biggest offender who was really behind the ball in terms of getting this uh, implemented. I think that report was not even contemplated in the settlement agreement. I think the first one required under the settlement agreement uh, comes out in the next few months here. Okay, that raises the question. We're down in a couple of minutes, but Ishmael, uh, uh, Israel, and, and Reverend Staden, what is the duty of the community to organize? Uh, we sort of can't wait for, you know, decent people to do the right thing. They, they may not get around to it, but our needs are present, and they're real, and they're right now. Do we have a need Ought we have a strategy, Scott Gray, all of you, to push this as opposed to passive uh, expectation? What, what do you think? Uh, and how would you do it as a Northside Resident Redevelopment Council? Well, our discussions have been with um, partner organizations such as Minneapolis Urban League and, um, and other outreach efforts by NCRC, um, Northside Community Reinvestment Coalition, into first getting the information and working with those that are on the ground. Um, the, our agency, the relationships that we have uh, have forged are, um, and, and like to build, are those with the information, those that have the information, so that we can get it disseminated and put it into a digestible form so that those that are on the ground, such as NCRC, are able to spread the word. Um, there is a, you know, our, it's no secret that we're in a recession, and so it takes time for us to come up with creative, creative collaborative efforts. And um, like I said, we're at the point of working with um, Ur Minneapolis Urban League to come up with some of those, come, some of those solutions, so we're not reliant on the information to come down to Organizing. us. Organizing, Reverend Stedden, how do we organize? Uh, one of the things that I believe very clearly since in having been involved and understand government for at least over the last 40 <laughs> some years, uh, you understand and I understand too, we, Minnesota has the lowest unemployment rate in America. It has the highest unemployment rate among blacks in America. Oftentimes, government does not necessarily listen to what is happening in, term, in terms of the pulse of the African American community unless we are involved in shaping the mechanism by which it would happen. I'm, and I hear uh, 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 what you're saying about a midterm report, I'm concerned that a lot of mechanisms that's been put in place right now may not necessarily do what they need to be done, or what needs to be done in terms of maximizing the po population of the availability of resources and having collect collective partnerships that in fact can get that done. Oftentimes, we want to go to church and say, you know, do everything, or we want to go to Urban League and say, do everything, uh, but there are no additional resources also to do everything. Scott, final word uh, on this. So what do we do from this institution's point of view to create partnerships, to raise the flag, and to uh, reach out to the banks, and to reach out to the Attorney General's office, and to the feds to make sure that our voice is heard, and that the solutions we seek are attained? Well, one is that I think we need to continue this discussion, uh, and we need to have our evaluator come back for another another session to tell us what's what's really going on here. 
Two is I think we need help from the AG's office um, to really, I mean, we have Wells Fargo. We have a big partner here um, and a number of other banks that we can work with that, um, that have um, a lot of resources that could help us get, push this word out to the street and make sure that people are responding to it. And I think we need to get more banks bought into this because we're not only seeing them settle on this DOJ, um, this, this statewide uh, or nationwide um, settlement, we're seeing them settle independently themselves on mortgage bias and all kinds of other racial steering, all kinds of other things that are going on. And, and they seem to not be blinking an eye on these uh, settlements. And so we know that there are deep pockets, but deep pockets need to reach into this community so that we can start to build our equity moving forward. So I, I would just say we may need um, our, um, our attorney general, general to really help us reach out to some of these banks to have a real intentional conversation on how we can really get this message out and create home ownership and restore people um, the American dream. Thank you for your, your comments. Thank you, Attorney General, uh, Deputy Attorney General Nate uh, Brenneman for being here. Thank you for your department's leadership and the Attorney General. Thanks, uh, Reverend Staten, for your leadership and your service. And thank you, Ishmael Israel, Director of Northside Residence Redevelopment Council, for your service and leadership as well. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. The issue is important. It's about home ownership. It's about wealth. It's about understanding that we have uh, needs that can be met, but we have to mobilize, we have to organize, we have to ask, we have to demand, we have to insist of ourselves first and everyone else that right prevail. Join us next week for another conversation with Al McFarland. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We got to say good night. We want to thank Al McFarland for bringing us all those great words and all our lovely guests, all the guests in the house. Everything's good, you know. So I want y'all to tune in every Tuesday morning, right around 9 o'clock. Because we're going to play a song. All the guests will be home. We'll be feeling like talking. Have a robust conversation. Our guest in the house, two million people out there. I know you're listening on the internet. KSA, hi. Come on, come on, listen to the show.